Dr. Tran here is developing sulfur sorbents that will take the sulfur out at room temperature out of the liquid fuel, which is very, very difficult to do. Hmm. And so he is synthesizing these sorbent compounds and looking at how much sulfur they can take out. Dr. Dunbar over there is looking at purifying gas streams to go into the fuel cell. And so basically, as I said, fuel cells like to run on hydrogen. And if you're looking at reforming something like methanol or JPA, you're not going to get just hydrogen. And so he's working on developing membrane materials that will only let hydrogen through. And those tend to be palladium based. This is equipment by which we look at the kinetics of reaction, so how fast a reaction goes with our electrodes. And so basically what we look at is by looking at the current and the voltage, applying it to a catalyst with what we want to oxidize is the fuel and solution. We can look at how fast and how much current it generates. And from that, if we do it as a function of stirring, we could actually determine which is the best catalyst to oxidize that fuel. We actually have Department of Energy fund some of our battery research. Okay. Um, we do not get money from companies. We try not to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have government customers who pay us money. I see. So, the, but the research that you do is it open source? In other words, can companies see what you're doing and say, we ah, publish great. it. We we'll publish use that for our X project because it's. We publish for pretty much everything in open peer reviewed literature. Okay. So what is the focus of this lab right here? Is it primarily a specific type of fuel cell? Or is it all types of fuel we cells? We actually look at all types of fuel cells. So we've looked at solid oxide, we've looked at reform methanol, we've looked at hydride, we've even looked at biofuel cells running on enzymes. Do you ever get any feedback from soldiers yourself about how they feel about this type of technology? We have. There's some concern about using flammable flammable fuel. Um, a lot of it is perception and um, and so we hope that if they train with them, certainly they're sitting in a truck with uh, flammable fuel sitting right underneath them. We are hoping that um, once soldiers find out how useful it is, they become much more accepting. Mm. You know, if it's worth it to them, it's you know, there are those who are out, you know, in the front that are probably using fuel cells. Um, but I don't know anything about their mission and won't. <laughs> this is a fuel cell made through a program that we had with a PEO Soldier. It was developed through a Defense Acquisition Challenge program with DuPont. Uh, so DuPont and SFC, this is, I think, the third generation of this fuel cell and it's a 25 watt direct methanol fuel cell. We did a lot of the characterization of the water balance in this fuel cell looking at what would be the optimum flow rates of fuel and what the water balance would be fed that back into the company as part of the agreement and research agreement that we had that PEO soldier had with them. So if I'm a soldier out in the field what what am I going to potentially right. use this for? Basically this has, was made to be a, a battery charger. So basically... A battery charger for my radio? Correct. For your radio, for your night vision goggles. Basically one of these will take the place of three 5590 batteries. And how, how big are those? They weigh about the same as this. So it's a third? They weigh. Correct. And so that was what this was developed for. This a stripped down version of this is the one that won the OSD wearable power price challenge. Gotcha. Uh, it had the highest energy density of all the fuel cells that completed the test. They made a whole bunch of them for West Point. This is the simplest direct methanol fuel cell. Well, you come on this side. All right, yeah. I'm going to have Dr. Tran pour some methanol in here. This is basically a one cell unit and it's Oh, it's probably about eight years old or six years old. And what is it doing to the methanol? Right now, the methanol is just coating in there. This is actually the heart 
of a meth methanol fuel cell. This is what's called an MEA. So it's basically catalyst on both sides, an anode and cathode, and this plastic looking stuff is the polymer electrolyte. So is the methanol passing through that? It's passing through the anode chamber. There's a path in there for the anode chamber. And you have to let a little bit, a little ways for the chemistry to do its stuff. This has probably been very dehydrated, so now we have to get it hydrated, get the electrolyte hydrated. And, um, but this is a very simple system. It has no pumps, it has no blowers. No it's electricity, just, obviously. It's air breathing, and so it just basically uh, breathes air. And we put, and, and you notice we just put a very little amount of methanol in there. As I said, we have to wait for it all to get hydrated and sometimes I give it a little push to help it. But in the meantime, so these are, these membrane electrode assemblies are actually the heart of all fuel cells, of all PEM-based, polymer electrolyte-based fuel cells. We had two of these. We made a whole bunch of these for um, the U.S. military economy. So now what little bit of methanol we put in there, there were like six, seven drops. We'll run this thing for about 11 hours. 11 hours? Yeah, that's how long we've, we've tested it. I guess it's not drawing a whole lot of No, power. no, this is, this is a little fan. Uh, and this is small wattage uh, fuel cell. But this just shows how simple, in theory, a fuel cell can be. This is air breathing, no moving parts, just a little bit of fuel in and air being breathed on the one side and we have power. Now, could, could any excess from this be steered towards a battery? Oh, yes. Yes, if we, you know, and so we size these things. There's, um, this is a fuel cell here currently being tested. This is actually an alkaline fuel cell. And this, I believe, is more of a 20-watt system. And so it's, it's, it's one cell. This is one of the experimental membranes that we're currently looking at. And meaning what, what is the membrane made of? This is an alkaline membrane. So it's a hydroxide, a base conducting membrane. As opposed to? An acid, which is what most fuel cells are made out of. Our new program is alkaline. And so we do have a few experimental membranes that we're looking at, seeing what the problems are and trying to make them better. And why not go that route traditionally? I mean, did no one think of this idea before or was it just cost prohibitive? No, mostly because it was lack of a membrane. There was no... So it just didn't exist until it, it just didn't exist, really. So, and, and fuel cells in general, fairly scalable, I mean... Yes, and in fact, that's one thing about electrochemical devices as opposed to chemical processes is all electrochemical processes are based on surface area. And so they scale with surface area. So the limit of a fuel cell size is Well, then it starts getting to be balance of plant as opposed to fuel cell based, okay? And so, you know, sizes of the pumps, sizes of the blowers, and those don't scale linearly. I see, so, so realistically, the largest sort of fuel cell we're talking about would be, would be what? Oh, they're, they're talking about for the grid of, you know, you know very high kilowatts, 50, 60, 100 kilowatt uh, SOFC type of, um, type of fuel cells. The uh, Department of Energy had a program called SICA, and which is looking at now using coal as a fuel for fuel cells. And how big physically are those fuel cells? I'm just trying to wrap my head around the size oh, of these things. They're, they're are they like the size of this room yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, they're very big. Wow. They're very big. Okay. Yeah, our, what we're, we tend to look at are things 20 kilowatts and under. So portable, portable. Uh, and then getting to the point of auxiliary power unit. But they have to be mobile. Right now, we're not looking at any stationary fuel cells for the Army.